Hi, everybody. Tim Baker. I'm just going to run through the leading change successfully module, successfully module, which is part of, of course, the Lunch and Learn series. So I want to give you a little bit of an overview as to how we can actually effectively manage change. You know, it's obviously not that easy. We, we all know that change is accelerating. We all know that change is happening around us all the time. But getting good at this topic is extremely important. So I want to give you a few tips on how you might do that more effectively. So uh, as you know, of course, we're up to number six on the list and we are now at a stage where we're about ready to finish the Lunch and Learn series, but you can see the topics that we've covered previously. Now, I do want to just quickly reiterate what we did last week, which of course was about influencing. And I hope you got a chance to complete your influencing capability profile. And I hope you found it useful to complete that. But ultimately, there are four different ways that we can influence anybody about anything. One of those is investigation, which is of course a logical approach using a push style. There's motivation, which is a emotional approach using a push style. There's calculation, which is a logical approach using a pull style and collaboration, which is a pull style using an emotional approach. Now, each of us favor one of those four. And so as a result of that, we, uh, we, we obviously would favor that in situations where it probably isn't required. And that's a problem. So we, we need to be flexible enough to be able to maneuver around this model. And that's ultimately the key to being effective at influencing people in different contexts and situations. All right, so let's launch into topic, the topic today and what we're going to cover. So I wanna look at the four emotional stages of change. And I say emotional stages of change is because when we all go through any change, regardless of whether it's a positive change or a negative change, there's a tendency for us to uh, feel certain things as we go through that. So I wanna make you aware of what they are. Now, the good news is that these four emotional states are 100% predictable. Uh, the bad news, if there is such a thing, is that your job as a leader is actually to be aware of these emotional stages and to be able to counter those with various strategies. So we're going to look at a model that I've put together, which really outlines these four emotional stages of change. And it's a very simple model, but it's a very effective model. And, and then I'm going to look at some of the strategies for change, which I would recommend to you. And then we'll finish up talking about some of the barriers to better conversations. Because this is our last module, I wanted to sort of sum up and talk about uh, nine barriers of, of uh, having better conversations with our people, ultimately. Okay, so let's launch into the a statement that I want to make just about there are myriad models out there on change. I'm sure you're aware of it. There are eight steps of this and the four steps of that. There are so many models out there, but I would suggest to you that a lot of those models are too focused on the steps that we need to take rather, and, and perhaps not enough on the people. It is actually the people that are going through the change and not the steps. And I think our focus is wrong and we need to concentrate on the people and what they might need as they go through any change process. And hopefully I can give you some clarity around that during our time together this morning. Now, this is the what I call the workplace roller coaster model. Now, you might say, well, where did I get this information from? Well, um, Kubler Ross, who uh, is one of the leading authorities on grief and trauma, identified a number of steps that people go through in situations of grief. And then later on, Scott and Jaffe came up with a model and adapted Kubler Ross's. Uh, model to the workplace. And so what I've done is I've adapted both of those to come up with this model that you're seeing in front of you right now. So what I want to do is just talk about this model and give you a sense of what it means. And then perhaps we can look at some of the different situations 
or the different strategies that are required under each step. So you'll notice up at the top of the model, there is a team-centered focus, and down the bottom is a self-centered focus. So that will fluctuate. Two of those stages or emotional steps are team-centered, and two of those, of course, are self-centered. Over on the left-hand side, you'll notice that there's a past focus, and over on the right-hand side, there's a future focus. And what that means is the past means that we, we think back to previous ways that things were done. Future focus is we're more focused on what's going to happen next. A team focus is that we take the attention of ourselves and on to other people that we're actually working with. And then there's the self-centered approach, which is, means, of course, that we're focusing on ourselves. Now, whenever any change has been implemented, regardless of what it is, the first stage that we all go through, whether we realize it or not, is rejection. And I'm going to give you a positive and a ne negative example about this in a moment. But rejection ultimately means that we just continue on as business as usual and don't embrace the change. So we reject the change to start with right at the beginning of it. We don't think it's real. We're in a state of denial and we just continue to do what we're doing. Now, you've probably found that in your own workplaces when you introduce a change or announce a change at work, you probably notice that people aren't really embracing it at all, which could of course be very frustrating and they're just going on their merry way the way they've always done things. So, and in, during that stage, people are focused on the past because, you know, this is how we've always done things. They're pretty much focused on the team. So they haven't changed at all psychologically or in any way. Now, let me give you two examples. Let's look at a negative example or an or a example that's probably a little traumatic. Let's assume that you're at home. It's a rainy night outside and you get a knock at the door. And of course, you're fairly startled and you're wondering who could that be at the door on this night at 11 o'clock at night on this rainy night? Anyway, you open the door and you see two police officers who are standing there and you're quite startled at this point. And basically those police officers announced some news to you that uh, a relative of yours was injured in a car accident that evening on the other side of town. Now, once that announcement's been made, um, you will at least momentarily be in a state of rejection. What I mean by that is that you just can't believe what you're hearing. And you'll often say things like, are you sure you've got the right house? Or is this real? When am I going to wake up? You're at a stage of rejection at that point. Now, going a little further, and not after the police officer explains some of the detail involved, you're going to move into a state of resistance. Now, the state of resistance in this case will be one where you might use, you know, you might do some finger pointing and saying, what were the police doing revenue raising on the other side of town? when they should have been dealing with this, um, you know, this, you know, this dangerous road, or why haven't the council fixed all the potholes up in the road? You're going to want to blame other circumstances for this difficult situation that you're facing. So you're going to be in a state of reject of resistance. Now, of course, after a short period of time, the police officers will leave the scene and you'll think to yourself, well, all we can do now is get to the hospital. Uh, we can only think one step at a time. We can't think any further. So let's uh, get in the car and get to the hospital as soon as possible because that's all we can focus on. So you're in a stage at this point which was called re reformation. So in other words, the, the thinking is very short term and you're just focused on the here and now. And of course, you know, uh, you get to the hospital and, and uh, can do what you need to do. But what will happen ultimately is that let's suggest that there's a period of time, let's say 10 years have passed, and Mr. and Mrs. Smith are sitting on their balcony. And Mrs. Smith turns to Mr. Smith and says, you know what, 
that what happened 10 years ago was a terrible incident. Remember when those police knocked on the door and we had to go to the hospital? Fortunately, everything turned out well. But one thing that was good, the silver lining was that we actually, we were drawn closer together as a result of that difficult circumstance. So you're in a stage at this, at this point of responsiveness. So you're now very responsive to what had happened in the sense that you can see the silver lining in the cloud. And this is the, this is the emotional roller coaster that all of us go through during change. We actually predictably go through these four stages. What is difficult is that people will go through these stages at different times. So your team at work will not go through rejection, resistance, reformation and responsiveness all at the same time. They will vary in terms of when they go through these stages. You too will vary in terms of when you go through these stages. And uh, so if I give you a positive example, just to show, just to illustrate what I mean by these four stages, let's imagine for a moment that you are at work Let's imagine that you get a phone call and, of course, you answer the phone and the person on the receiving end of the phone says to you, congratulations, you have just won $20 million in lotto. Now, your first reaction is going to be what? It will actually be rejection. In other words, you won't face the reality of the situation. You'll probably say to the person calling you, is this a hoax call? Or is this real? Or who are you? Or, um, you know, so you're actually going to be in a state of rejection at that point. And that would be quite normal under those circumstances. Very shortly, it'll start to seep in that this change is real, that you did in fact win this money. And you will momentarily be in what psychologists call cognitive dissonance you'll be in a state of resistance, just mild resistance, obviously, in this case, because it's a pretty good thing that you've done, that you know, it's a pretty good circumstance to be in. But you will be in a stage of resistance, and that will be where you will say, um, should I tell people or should I not? What should I do about this? And how will I deal with it? Because obviously it's a big deal. It's a life-changing circumstance for you. So you'll be in a state of resistance for a very short period of time. Very soon, of course, you'll be in reformation and that reformation is, worth, is, is really how are we going to spend the money? You know, what are the priorities? What are we going to do? So you'll be in a reformation stage fairly quickly and you'll probably make lists and all sorts of things and be quite excited about it, moving on to responsiveness where, of course, you might crack open the champagne and be celebrating the fact that you've won this money. So you can see that you can go through these four stages, whether it's a positive or a negative situation. And we all go through this. I'm sure you've all heard the saying, life is a roller coaster ride. And I think there's a lot of truth to that, meaning, of course, that this curve that I'm explaining to you, this roller coaster, is actually something that we continually go through. So after we go through one change, we go down the roller coaster ride again and up the roller coaster ride. So life is a continual process of roller coaster rides. And I think we could all relate to that. And we can all think of examples where we've looked back on something that's happened in the past and thought to ourselves, that wasn't great. But then we look back on it and we think, well, it, you know, it was quite fortuitous that it occurred because it brought these great things into life, which is great. So you get to a stage where uh, these four emotional stages happen at work as they do at home, and we just continually go through this roller coaster ride. Uh, let me give you an example where a manager may not actually use these four stages and will sort of scratching their head wondering what to do. Let's imagine that a manager pulls his or her team aside and the manager is going to brief the team and explain to the team members that as of Monday, there's going to be a new sort of customer relationship system that's going to be implemented in the business. And 
at the end of the presentation, he explains very clearly why it's being implemented, what the pitfalls are going to be. So he does a pretty good job of explaining all of that. And at the end of the presentation, he says to his team members, does anyone have any questions? And of course, there's dead silence. And the interpretation that the leader might make is that everybody's on board because there's no negative questions or no questions and everyone must think it's a great idea. And then as he walks out of the meeting room, he notices that two people who were in the meeting are actually at the water cooler and speaking very negatively about the change. And the manager pulls them up and said, why didn't you say something earlier on in the meeting? Why are you talking about this at the water cooler? So the problem here is that the manager has misunderstood the situation because during the meeting, people were in the state state of rejection and as they absorbed the information that the manager gave them and as they were outside the meeting room after they got into a state of resistance and the manager assumed that of course they just didn't speak up at the meeting that all that's happened is they've just actually moved into resistance now a far better way of managing that would be for you for example to explain the circumstances and make sure you give people plenty of time. So you, you're going to state to the, you get the team together and you'll, you'll, you might say to them, in three weeks' time, we're implementing a new customer relationship management system. And I just want to do brief and inform you about that. And I, what I'd like you to do at the end of this meeting, once I've explained why we're doing this, is uh, we're going to meet again in a week's time because you may undoubtedly have questions that you'd like to ask me about that. Now, what the manager's done is separated one meeting from the other. Now, the next time the meeting occurs, of course, there will be a lot of negativity and there will be a lot of questions. And the reason is, is that the manager's given the team members breathing space to move from rejection to resistance. And so the next meeting, of course, will be a little hostile and people will be making comments like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, uh, those sort of comments, and they will be quite resistant of the change. But the manager, by doing it that way, has contained the resistance within the realms of the team. So, you know, and then, of course, one of the big probably of those four emotional stages, the one that we're very familiar with and we're very, we can see happening quite a lot in the workplace and in our home life as well, is resistance. Now, the truth of the matter is you can't bypass these four stages. It's impossible to go straight from, you know, and making an announcement to people being responsive to the change. That is never going to happen even in a positive situation, as I outlined earlier. So you, you have to recognise that the key is to manage each of these emotional stages. Now, when people are in resistance, you'll probably find that some of your team have moved on to reformation. So you might have, say, 10 people in your team and two of them are resisting and the other eight are in reformation. Now, what does it mean when they're in reformation? Well, in reformation, they're actually tinkering with the new change. They're not confident in how to implement it, but they're at least giving it a go. Whereas in resistance, people have got their arms folded and their eyes crossed and they're not really on board at all. The problem with that is that we probably spend too much time on the two people that are in resistance and not enough time on the eight people that have moved on to reformation. And I can give you a very clear analogy of this. If you think about a bus, you're, you're, you're the driver of a bus and the bus is idling and you've asked your team members to join you on the bus. Now, the bus is going to a destination which is symbolic for the change. So you've got, your, you've got eight of your team members reluctantly sitting on the bus while you're in the driver's seat. But you look out the window and you notice two of your team members are sitting in the bus shelter. In other words, they're not going to come on board. These are what you might call professional resistors. You give them free beer and they'll complain that it's not cold, that kind of person that I'm talking about. So anyway, 
what you do is you get on, you get it, you you stop, you turn the engine off, you get off the bus, you go and sit in the bus shelter, and you spend a bit of time or a lot of time trying to convert these professional resistors to get on board the bus, which is the metaphor for change. But you notice that you're not very successful in doing that. Because I can tell you that there are two things that professional resistors want most of all in life. They want attention and they want power. And you're giving them both by sitting in the bus shelter with them. Now, I'm not suggesting you should ignore them, but by, by spending you know, a considerable amount of time trying to convert them, the eight people that are on the bus are probably going to be a little annoyed about that and think, well, we're the ones taking the risk. We don't know where you're going. We don't know what the destination is, but we're, we're reluctantly sitting here and you're spending all your time with these two people who clearly are going to reject or resist anything. So you see, the problem here is that you can't ignore the two people in the bus shelter, but by the same token, you mustn't give them a disproportionate amount of attention. So what do you actually do? Well, come back to the situation where you're in the bus, uh, you, you're in the driver's seat, you've got eight of your team members sitting in the bus and you notice that two people are not in the bus. So what do you do? Well, you don't turn the engine off. That's the first thing because the symbolism of doing that is that you are holding us ransom. You keep the bus idling. You get off the bus. You walk over to the bus shelter. You sit down in the... Or the uh, you sit down in the shelter and you say to the two people, very courteously, you say, look, I realise you're not on the bus. I realise you've got some concerns about where we're going. I'm quite happy to hear what those concerns are. But just understand that in 15 minutes, I will be leaving. And I'd like to think that you could both be on board with us. But in the meantime, tell me what your concerns are. And of course, for the next 15 minutes, you give them your undivided attention. You don't get defensive about it, but you listen to what they have to say. And then after 15 minutes has, has gone by, you stand up and you say, well, I'm about to leave now and I would like you both to join me on the bus. So all the pressure, all of the responsibility is on those two people to make the journey onto the bus. And you've put a situation there where you've been courteous and given them your 100% undivided attention, but ultimately it's up to them to make the decision to get on the bus. And you might find that uh, they decide to uh, get on the bus, they may decide not to, but the reality is you're going to move on. And I often call this be hard on the change and soft on the people. What do I mean by that? Well. Being hard on the change means the change is, is you know, it's, it's inevitable. We're going ahead. I'm going to drive off eventually. I'm going to take the team where I need to take them. Soft on the people, on the other hand, means that you give people the dignity and courtesy to explain why they don't want to get on the bus. You see, now, often it's the other way around. Be we find that people are soft on change and hard on the people. What does that mean? Well, it means that people are very critical of these resistors and tell them to be team players and get quite hostile about it. But they might also say that they think the change isn't all that great anyway, and you can understand some of their concerns. So <clears throat> what I've done here is I've been soft on the change and hard on the people. What I should be is hard on the change and soft on the people. So think about that. And when people get to reformation, just understand that their skill sets are low. They're willing to give the change a go, but they're probably not sure what they need to do. So your job during reformation is to give people coaching and mentoring to help them to be able to master the change. So let's look at some of the differences um, and some of the things that we need to do in these four stages. So during the rejection stage, <clears throat> now remember, during rejection, of course, people have got their head in the sand. They're concentrating on doing things the old way when you want people to do things another way. 
So the first thing you need to do is to accept that this is inevitable. It's not something, you know, by the stage you're, you're announcing change to people, you're probably completely converted and you're probably very excited about the change. But just understand the first time people hear it, they're not going to be at all excited about it. They're going to be in the phase of rejection. So the first thing is just accept that it's inevitable. Give people time to get through this phase. It's not going to happen instantly. And that's why I suggest that you perhaps have a meeting initially to explain why we're going down the road of change. Give people time to absorb it and bring them back for, for questions later on. As I said, be hard on the change and soft on the people. In other words, let people know that the change is inevitable and let people also be able to air their views. And that's important. And of course, the key in any change is to explain the change, but to do it in a way, not so much that this is in the best interest of the business, but explain how the change is going to benefit the individual. So the more you can personalise the information around the change, the more likely people will accept the change or at least get to a point of, of the next stage. So these are some steps right at the outset. Now, once you've done those things and if you do them reasonably well, the paradox is that people will probably be resisting and they'll be annoyed. Just remember this, that when people are resisting anything, it's, it's because they know it's real. So ironically, resistance is a more productive emotion than rejection because in rejection, people have got their head in the sand, whereas at least in resistance, they accept that it's real and that's a good thing. So during this resistance stage, try to get people to focus on the future. Now, people will be wallowing around in the past and perhaps considering how this you know, the old way was far better than the new way. But that, that, of course, isn't constructive because you want people to move on. Acknowledge their resistance. Now, when I say acknowledge their resistance, I don't mean try and convert them. I mean actually actively listening to the concerns that people have. And just close your mouth and listen to some of the concerns that people have and acknowledge those. Because, quite frankly, you'll probably have the same feeling when you first heard about the change from your manager anyway. So listen, acknowledge and support is critical to your success. And of course, as I said earlier, notice the transition between uh, the, you know, the first stage of rejection and uh, moving on to reformation. People will, will uh, come to those points at different times. Now, during reformation, of course, People are willing to give the change a go, but they probably don't have a great capacity for it because it's new. So be aware that people will enter this phase at different times, as I said earlier with the bus analogy. Seek the support of those people who have successfully entered the exploration phase. So those people, of course, are the ones that you, you need to work with because they're the ones who are taking off the risk by being involved in the change. And of course, your job is to facilitate the coach and support. I would suggest to you to be out and about at this point. I would suggest for you to be very hands-on and be able to counter any insecurities or concerns that people have during the change process at this point. Now, if you do that well, what ultimately will happen is that people will actually be quite positive about the change. Have you ever noticed that the people who kind of rejected your ch the changes that you implement in your own teams, have you ever noticed that after a period of time, they're quite responsive to the change? Not always, but in many cases, it is the case. Now, at this stage, it's a positive step because people now not only have accepted the change and are responsive to the change, but are also highly skilled in being able to implement the change because they've had training and development and so forth. So one of the key things that you can do here is review progress. And what I mean by that is give people 
you know, give people an opportunity to talk about the journey that they've been on. And a lot of people don't do this because they're too busy moving on to the next thing. Celebrate. Now, what I mean by celebrate, just acknowledge the journey that people have been on because it's been a fairly stressful roller coaster ride and people need to understand that you appreciate the effort that they've put in to get to this stage of responsiveness. Recognise and acknowledge their commitment because at this stage, of course, they are committed to the change and that it is important that you do that. And one of the reasons that it's important that you do that, apart from just being courteous, is that very soon there's going to be another roller coaster ride. So you want to energize your team before they go down the roller coaster ride next time round. So mentor people, develop them as a team, and help them to, because remember at this stage, people are looking beyond their own self interest. So they are in a stage where you can help them to, to, uh, to work together effectively to make the change work. So if you time these interventions well, then the idea is that you're still going to go through, through the roller coaster ride, but the point is that you'll be able to do it a lot more effectively than you would if you don't use these tips. So if the first thing is to recognise where are people up to in terms of their own emotional state during a change process and to respond to that in the right way. And if you do that, you're likely to be far more effective as a change manager. The important thing also for you as a leader is to acknowledge yourself in this process. So it's important in the early stages to, to notice your denial. You know, when you're first, when your manager announces to you a change, you're probably going to be in the same state that your people are going to be in when you announce it to them. So seek out information and face reality. And then you're probably going to be resistant as well. And that's okay, but acknowledge your feelings and take small steps. It's quite reasonable to be defensive about a change because, again, it goes back to our primitive survival instinct that we like things to be the way, you know, to be very uh, stable and predictable. And when you get to reformation, understand and learn from exploration. So create a vision, seek out learning opportunities to improve yourself and improve your ability to get through the change. And then when you get to the stage of, uh, when you get to the final stage of, and you're committed, reward yourself. Why? Because you need to re-energize yourself because you're gonna go down the roller coaster ride at some point. And stay vigilant because before long there will be a, there will be a um, there will be another roller coaster ride to go through. So, folks, that's the four emotional stages of change. And what I want to do to finish up our lunch and learn series is I want to talk about some of the barriers around having conversations because I think it's really important to finish this up. This. Lunch and Learn series has been entitled Better Leadership Conversations. So here are a couple of things to think about. One of the things that people often don't do very well is be attentive during conversations for lots of reasons, many of which because they've got many things on their plate at the one time. But it's really, really important to, if you're going to have a conversation with someone, then multitasking is not a good idea. So close the laptop, turn away from the computer, put your phone out of the way, give the person 100% undivided attention. And uh, you'll find that the conversation will go a lot better. You'll find that uh, people aren't in, you know, getting distracted by a whole range of other things. So if you're working in an environment where there are a lot of distractions, then it might be a good idea to leave that environment and find somewhere where you're not going to be distracted. The second thing that's important in conversations at work is to is is not to restrict information channels. You often hear people say, you'll get told on a need to know basis. Or another saying you might often hear is no news is good news. So in other words, people who are in leadership roles often don't give people all the information that they require. So it's very important to open up the channels of communication and give people the information they need. 
After all, isn't it true that you want them to listen to you? And isn't it true that you also want them to be able to see your perspective? And the only way you can do that is by giving them all the information that they need. So don't, uh, I mean, I accept that there are some things, of course, where you can't give people information it could, because it's confidential, absolutely, and no one's suggesting otherwise. But I think in a lot of cases, we fail to give people the full scope of information when we're explaining a situation or a change or whatever it is. So give people all the information that they need. Three, it's important that you give people feedback on how they're managing whatever it is that they're managing. So I think this is one of the biggest problems in the world of work is that we don't give people enough feedback. And what that means is that we do know from some research from Gallup that there's a correlation between a lack of feedback and disengagement. So if you want people engaged, you need to give them regular feedback, whether it's positive feedback or negative feedback or what I might call constructive feedback and positive feedback. They still need that feedback and that's very, very important. Four, I think you need to ask people questions. So a good conversationist is somebody who's very good at asking open-ended questions. Why, what, when, who, where, how, and, and uh, got one there, and why, I think. Anyway, the point is, if you ask questions with those words in it, it's likely that you're gonna get more than a no or a yes. So in other words, in good conversationists ask people, and I often use the term be respectfully curious. And the way to be respectful, uh, respectfully curious is to ask open-ended questions. Five, not too much formality. I often find the best meetings are the meetings that are, that are held away from the workplace. So go for a walk, go and have a cup of coffee somewhere I think you'll find that you'll get much more out of that than having that in your office. So if you have a meeting in your office, if you have an office, the truth of the matter is you're going to feel comfortable in that office, but the person on the receiving end is not going to feel that comfortable because it's not their territory. So you're better off going off somewhere else to have that cup of coffee and that conversation. Of course, I had to talk about emails and we do know that the average person spends over two and a half hours a day managing email. Now, I'm not suggesting that we abandon email. I think it's an important communication tool. But what I will say is that I think a lot of us have conversations via email, which is not a good way to go. Email is an asynchronous technology, meaning, of course, that when you send someone an email, you don't receive a response instantaneously. Sometimes you don't receive a response at all, as we know. So I think often if you're thinking about having a conversation via email, the best thing that you can do is actually get on the phone, get on Zoom, or uh, just uh, you know go and talk to them face to face is often a better way of dealing with that than to actually do that over email. We're all we all get frustrated with that. We all know the pitfalls of having a conversation via email. Seven, it's really important that the people in your organisation who are leading the organisation, whether that's you or others, it's really important that you model the correct behaviour. Now, if your leadership team, for example, are having meetings behind closed doors, there seems to be a lot of thumping at the table and a lot of aggression and so forth, then that will mirror itself throughout the organisation. So a place to start is with the leadership team and to make sure that they're engaged in positive conversations. Eight, a fear of emotion. Often we don't raise issues with people that we should because we fear what it might bring out. We often say, let sleeping dogs lie or don't open a can of worms. But the truth is, just because you don't discuss something doesn't mean it goes away. It doesn't. You know, all that's happening is it's swept under the carpet, but it'll, of course, rear its head at some point. So I think be courageous and have that conversation with people. 
you'll feel a lot better about yourself and you might find it'll go better than you think it will go. Often the fear is because we've interpreted how we think it might go and we find out, of course, it's gone a lot better than perhaps we thought. So don't be, don't, uh, don't um, uh, not say things because you're worried about how the other person might react. Just put it on the table in a respectful way, of course, and to do it in a way where you can move forward and be constructive. Your people will appreciate you doing that. And number nine, and there's some things you can't do, you may not be able to do much about this, depending on how your office is set up. But many years ago, workplace architects developed offices, as you'd be aware, around open plan. So no longer were there the closed door offices as much as there is now, and we've got open spaces where people can collaborate. The problem is, of course, is that these open office environments, when you actually speak up and you say something to someone else, you, you can be assured that 10 or 15 other people in the open office environment will overhear that conversation. So, of course, it's counterproductive because we tend not to open up and speak because we're concerned that other people might hear the conversation. By the time you try and book a room, it's often too late. And so I think the open office environment layout has actually been an impediment to open conversations and communication. And I think it's a problem generally. So I think that um, fortunately, new office layouts, as of, from my experience now, are far more conducive to having conversations. There are breakout areas, there are still private rooms, there are still open office environments. There's just a mixture of different type of spaces that allow people to have these regular conversations, which is great. So folks, that brings us to an end. And I'd like to uh, ask you to frame your change conversations around the model. So if you frame it around the four different emotional states that I've given you, you're far more likely to be able to get good reaction for change. And I think too many of these change models have been very much um, you know, linear or all about what has to change. Actually, what we're trying to change is people. We're not trying to change things, we're trying to change people. So keep the model uh, top of mind next time you're working with that with people. So there's rejection, there's resistance, there's reformation, and there's uh, recognition. So use the model to help you frame and plan change. So folks, that's the end. I've enjoyed working with you in the Lunch and Learn series and be aware that I've got another one starting on Friday on Teams. And uh, I've also got a number of books out on each of the topics that we've covered during the course of this Lunch and Learn series. So thank you everyone, all the very best. I wish you well, and at this stage, uh, we will finish at this point. So thank you and goodbye.